Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying Sasquatch encounters. Now, before I start, I want to let you know that on this channel, I like to share encounters that are more of a slow boil, that tend to create an atmosphere and a mood. If you're a fan of encounters like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those videos go live. All right, let's get right into it. It was deer season in 1978 when my brother and I had ventured into the region north of Caribou, Maine, near Eagle and Square Lakes. This was an area in which we had hunted many times and had scored fairly well through the years. Getting fairly near to the location with our truck, we still had a reasonably long hike into the area where we were to begin our stalk. It was several hours later when we had scored our first buck of the season, and having butchered and bagged it, we were making our way out of the forest. At some point, being overcome by the burden of carrying such a heavy load, I had stopped to put the pack down and placed my hand against a tree in a leaning posture. As soon as my hand hit the tree, I drew it back quickly, having felt something sticky and moist. As I pulled my hand away to look at it, with my palm now facing me, I knew immediately from years of hunting that my hand was smeared with viscous, sticky, old animal blood. My brother said to me, Oh my God, what is that? I said to him it was on the tree, and at the same time, we both looked up. Draped over a limb about 20 feet off the ground was the complete body of a doe, and it was not old at all. We could see that it was fully intact, with the exception being that both of its front legs were snapped off. They were two stubs, which we could plainly see from our position. With that, my brother Barry gets the harebrained idea, which he is going to climb up and pull it down, which he proceeded to do. He, now having blood from the tree all over his clothes and hands, he gave the doe a shove and she came tumbling down to the ground with a whack. Standing over it, she didn't appear to be a day old and more than likely had been placed there this very day which we had found her. Based on the lack of resistance as we grabbed the head, it appeared as though the neck had been broken as well, but by what? In all of our day's hunting, we had neither seen nor heard of such a thing being found in Maine. We began to examine the tree's trunk, looking for any indication of something having climbed the tree, and there was nothing to be seen. No black bear would have left the carcass untouched, and I had never heard of a black bear treeing its catch. With both of the legs being broken cleanly, and with the neck being broken, the rest of the hide was completely untouched. No claw marks, the carcass was in perfect condition. When we made it back to Priesk Isle, we had stirred up no small commotion with our talking about our find. Having left the doe in the woods, it was then that one of our cronies had said, why didn't you bring it out so we could see it? To which we said we were already carrying a 125 pounds of meat. They became so incensed about what we had said that it was decided we would go back and get the doe. The following day, having driven back up there and hiked back in to where the doe had been, it was gone. With the discovering of the deer being gone, this kid Joey starts blowing off 
how we planned this all out to freak everyone out. And I said, wait a minute, you asked us to come here. I didn't even want to go, nor did I ask you. With that, he and the others started to look around. When this guy Frank said, hey, check this out. He pointed to and staring at what was a large singular footprint in the soft peat. Then one of the boys said it was the footprint of a hairy man. Well, as you would imagine, that about iced the proverbial cake for all of us, and being unarmed, we exited hastily, to say the least. I and the others were now believers in something that we had all heard about in passing through the years and had never seen. With this newfound evidence of the first deer and now the footprint, we were convinced that there was something large and well able to kill wandering around up here, and it changed our lives and thoughts on a permanent basis. On to the next story. It's easy enough in some cases to disregard the testimony of one eyewitness as the product of hallucination or human error, as many do. But when a group of people all see the same thing, it becomes increasingly more difficult to dismiss. No less than three witnesses observed a tall, hair-covered inhumanoid with red eyes bound down a cliff face and run out into the road in front of their car one night in 1990 near Scottsville, causing them to run off the road. We were driving down through the countryside near a community called Perrytown. One of the witnesses, Willie C., later stated, as we got to the edge of the bridge at a place known as House Bluff, I looked up on the cliff and it was horrible looking. Its eyes glowed red and it stared directly at us. My two friends didn't believe me until it jumped down into the creek and ran in front of the car and caused us to run off the road. According to Willie, the creature was between seven and nine feet tall, with brownish-orange hair and glowing red eyes. It made screaming sounds while running, which sounded like the screams of a woman. I was fifteen when I saw this creature, he stated, and I have told very few here about it because most would accuse you of being on drugs or being insane. Willie told this story in early July of 2010, 20 years after the events of allegedly took place, and found him to be quite serious about the incident, as might be expected from someone who was telling the truth and not on drugs or insane. He was now 34 years old, but still remembered that night just like it was yesterday. The incident took place a couple of miles outside of Scottsville in southern Allen County back in 1990 when he was 15 years old. As he and two others were driving through the mountainous region near Perrytown just after dark on the evening of October 20th, 1990, he happened to glance up at a cliffside and spied the creature. Incredibly, it then jumped down onto a ridge and into the creek and ran out over a small bridge in front of their vehicle. The driver, his cousin, was so startled that he ran off the road and into a ditch. Willie was also able to add that the figure ran much faster than a man could. As fast as a deer, only on two legs, the scream it admitted as it ran away was very loud and unsettling to the entire group, sounding just like a terrified woman screaming. The sight scared the hell out of them all. At the closest point, it was only about 20 feet away from the vehicle and its passengers, which enabled them to get a pretty good look at the thing. Its face looked like a cross between an orangutan and a Neanderthal, 
with a flat nose like a gorilla's. Its eyes did not actually glow on their own, but reflected red in the vehicle's headlights. Although huge, it was built like a man, with normally proportioned arms and legs. It had the hands of a man as well, but with long fingernails. The area of Allen County, known in 14 circles as being the home of a place called Monkey Cave Hollow, named thusly by the early settlers for the race of monkeys that were living in the area when the pioneers arrived. These strange monkeys reportedly foraged for food at night and lived in the caves, with the last of them being hunted to extinction over a hundred years ago. Willie described the location in which the incident took place as a heavily wooded, rocky bluff with at least one cave in the area. Did some of the monkeys survive the blazing guns of the early residents of Allen County? There is no doubt. Another resident of Scottsville, this time an elderly woman, claims that she saw a tall, upright monster covered in white somewhat curly hair outside her home on Durham Springs Road on two separate occasions in the spring of 2002. Both the sightings took place in the evening. On the first occasion, she had just walked outside her home to see the thing reclining beneath a large beech tree in her front yard. After a few moments, she said it simply got up and walked on two feet just like a person would do, back into the woods. Like many other counties in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, Allen County has a history of high strangeness of every sort. The Scottsville area in particular seems especially prone to appearances by hairy inhumanoids or the monkey man as it is called locally. Some locations are even named after these mysterious humanoids, Monkey Man Hollow, for instance, and Monkey Cave Hollow. Mentioned in Lauren Coleman's classic, Mysterious America. These names were given by the early settlers and reflect the presence of these creatures in such areas, presences which are still felt in recent times. On the second occasion, the witness, a grandmother, actually got a shotgun and was intending to shoot the thing, but was stopped and pulled back into the house by her grandson out of concern for her safety. According to the grandson, a neighbor who lived down the road also encountered a similar creature, this one covered in shaggy brown hair in broad daylight. When his dogs gave chase, the thing leapt over a fence and disappeared into the valley below. The creature's mournful screams have been heard in the area for generations. At around 9 p.m. one evening in the fall of 2006, yet another lone motorist got a glimpse of the unknown. Neil A. was taking a shortcut to his home in rural Scottsville, Kentucky, when the event unfolded. I was driving down Bridge Hollow Road, he said, which is a shortcut I take to get from the Barren River Lake area to my house. I was driving slow because it was night on a one-lane road. As the vehicle topped a small hill, he was shocked to see a huge animal run down an embankment on the right-hand side of the road and cross directly in front of him. It turned briefly and looked back, the witness stated, then struck out across a creek bottom on the left side of the road and disappeared into the woods. It stood around seven to eight feet tall, Neil claimed with long, mangy hair all over its body. It was definitely male because, as it turned to look at my car, I could see a protrusion in the genital area. The witness did not feel threatened because, despite its size, the creature did not act aggressively at all. Every other description I have read makes this creature out to be very aggressive, he said. I don't think that is the case. 
When the animal turned and looked at me, the only emotion I saw in his eyes was peace. It reminded me of the movie Harry and the Hendersons, a very intelligent and human-like creature with feelings and emotions. Perhaps even thought, Neil said, the creature appeared very calm and did not make any sounds, but he felt sure that he heard its howls in the area on several occasions. Scottsville, Kentucky also has a history of UFO activity and animal disappearances. On to the next story. It was in August of 2007 and my grandson, Brandon, was here for the summer. He would be a senior when school started. Brandon lived with my son in California. We drove to the Sawtooth Forest about 28 miles south of my home. We had been at this location many times, even rode horses up there. We turned off at Maelstrom Hollow and went up the steep grade to get to the Beaver Dam. I should have taken the first dirt road after getting to the top of the grade, but passed it. When I realized it, I turned my truck around and went back to the correct road. We had the windows down. It was a hot day. And I noticed it was very quiet. No birds singing, no noise, and a very eerie feeling. Later, on the way home, Brandon said he had the same feeling. About one mile in, I pulled off and parked. We would walk the rest of the way to the beaver dam. I had my dog, and Brandon insisted on putting her on a leash. I said, okay, if you lead her. The dam was about a quarter mile walk from the truck. We were almost to the dam when I stopped Brandon. An unknown fear had taken over me. I told him we can't go any further or something bad will happen. The road had a slight curve, and I was looking at something tall and gray through the trees. I heard mumbling and smelled a strong odor. Brandon said he heard sticks banging. He froze, looking off to the west of where I looked, and he said, Grandma, there's something over there. Then my dog barked with hackles raised. He said it was hunched over and stood up staring at him. It had dark hair all over it. When it looked at him, you could tell it had bright yellow eyes. He was able to look away only when my dog barked. I said, let's get out of here, but walk. Don't run. Don't look like prey. At the time, I didn't know what we had encountered. We were almost to the truck. I gave Brandon the key and said, now run and get into the truck. He said it followed us, staying in the tree line. Brandon and Sheba, my dog, kept looking back at it. I was too scared to look. It was the evilest feeling I have ever had. Brandon said the same thing. We drove out, and that is when I finally felt safe again. I hope you enjoyed those stories, and if you did, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those go live. Again, thank you so much for watching the video, and until next time, bye!